I'm Chief Don Stevens of the Nohegan Abenaki Tribe. We're one of the largest tribes in Vermont. There are four of us, four tribes in Vermont. There are the uh, Nohegan, which is up the Northeast Kingdom, which means place of the fish traps. So it's the Nohegan Band of Kusak Abenaki Nation. Other native people would know us as people of the place, people <coughs> of the place of the fish traps who live in the pines who see the first light. That's how native people would know us because Kusak means pine, Abenaki means first light. So it'd be Nohegan, which is fish traps, pines, who live in the pines, and who see the first light. So that gives you, that tells you who we are. Our territory goes up in the Northeast Kingdom, up into Canada, across New Hampshire and Moosehead Lake in Maine, all the way down through New Hampshire and and uh, into Massachusetts, where we meet the, uh, the Narragansett, the Nipmucks, uh, the Wampanoags, and all of the native people who control that territory. The next tribe is Missisquoi. They live the St. Francis Sokoki Band of Missisquoi. They live up, uh, most people know them, uh, up in the uh, Franklin County Swanton area. They have a little less people than we do. They've been uh, really heavily politically active, if anybody ever knew Homer St. Francis. Uh, he was kind of in your face kind of guy and, and he really helped out with uh, keeping us out in the public. So uh, there, there's this Franklin County and, and uh, on the Lake Champlain up into Canada and uh, they are uh, Sokoki. In other words, they're of the turtle clan. The rest of us are all bear. Then there's the El Nu, which is in the southern part of Vermont. Gen Jamaica, Putney area is about 150, 200 uh, El New citizens, and uh, they control kind of the southern part. And then you got the Coasock traditional band, which is kind of Bedford, Averill area, uh, Coas Meadows. Uh, won't go into too much detail. They're about 150, 200 people, so there's not a lot of us left. So uh, we do the best we can to educate people that we're your neighbors and we're still here. We didn't die. So I'm gonna do a, a welcoming song for you, just so I can teach you a song. And this can be filmed and recorded if you want. It's just a welcoming song. It's only got really two words, okay? So you can, uh, you, you'll learn your first Abenaki song, which is welcoming. And this is only sung as a welcome song. Kwe Kwe means greetings. This is Quano Day, which is the uh, same thing, but it's, it's only sung, it's a welcoming song. means our land. So I'm going to set my uh, drum over here. So I've been asked to come today to welcome uh, our visitors here uh, to our land so that they can speak to you today about what they have going on. But I want to let you know a little bit about the Abenaki people. I already basically told you the four the tribes that make up the Abenaki people here, and there's two up in Canada, which are Odenak and Wollenak. 
They're the reserves. We fought with New France. So I'll give you a little idea of what the regalia is. We call it regalia. This is a ribbon shirt. Okay, modern days we would we wear ribbon shirts. We don't wear skins. I mean, when we do our living history, we might wear buckskin or, or something to uh, to honor our ancestors. But there's two clans. Like I said, the turtle and the bear. The kusuk or the bear. We live inland. We live near the, the woods. The turtle on the lake. So <clears throat> we are part of two confederacies. Back in 2015, we brought people here. The Wabanaki Confederacy, which is made up of five nations of people, the Mi'kmaq, Penobscot, Maliseet, um, the Abenaki, uh, and, uh, let me see, and Mi'kmaq, Penobscot, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, Abenaki, five. Then we're also part of the Seven Nations of Canada, which the Seven Nations of Canada were the people on the front line. If you knew anything about history, this became New France when the settlers came. Over in the New York side became English territory. So we fought with the French. So the people, part of the Wabanaki Confederacy, are people allied with the French, but they may not be on the front line. Like the Penobscots weren't on the front line. They were over on the, on the coast. We were on the front because we had to control the lake, which was the, the, the whoever controlled the lake controlled the fur trade. Because the Dutch were on the southern part, the English were on the northern, I mean the New York side, and we were on the, uh, the eastern side. So whoever controlled the lake controlled the fur trade. So we, those were allied with the French, but the people who were on the front lines who actually fought the British and the Iroquois, that's the seven nations of Canada, like the Huron. Anybody seen the movies Black Robe and a few of the other things where they're decimated by the Iroquois people? There were some, actually three Iroquois tribes that were part of the French alliance and also the Abenaki and the Algonquin and so on and so forth. I won't go into the history part of it, but just gives you an idea of how this was all laid out. So, you want to want to hear all these boring statistics. You guys might want to know how Lake Champlain and, I do. and Champ was formed, right? Now, I've seen you guys at the Maritime Museum. Exactly. That's right, I know you guys. I've seen you. Anyway. I'm going to tell you how Lake Champlain was born and how Champ came to be. Everybody wants to know how Champ came to be. I already knew that. Well, good. <laughs> and you'll know, so you've got to be quiet. <laughs> and see if I still got the same story. I'm just kidding. I want you to listen, because then you'll remember it. All right. The lake. And our language is called Bitabok. The lake between. The lake between us and our enemy, the Mohawk. We're not enemies anymore, but at the time, it was our enemy. So it was the lake between us and our enemy, Bitabok, okay? And Dakana, our land. Chant, Gitsigog. Gitsigog means horned serpent. Gitsigog. Great horned serpent we call underwater panther. So, here goes. You guys ready to hold on to your seat? Anybody know who Atiozo is? Anybody know? All right. But what was Atiozo? What's his, what is he for? Wait, I just forgot what, what, which one of those oh, okay. people I remember he is. We'll tell you what he is then. Okay. I forgot which one. I think he's been dancing him on That's okay. It's okay. Atiozo. Atiozo means transformer in our language. Oh, now I remember. It is rock thunder. You guys call it Rock Dunder, which is off Shelburne Point. If you go down to the waterfront near Echo, you can see Rock Dunder off from Shelburne Point. When the Creator, when the Creator was making this, this land, and I'm going to skip through our creation stories because that's a whole other story. But when dust was falling from the Creator's hands and landed on the back of Tolba, which is the Mother Earth turtle, that's why it's called Turtle Island. When the dust was falling down and landed on the turtle's back, well, a lot of things started to appear, started to create themselves out of the magical dust as it fell to earth. It was Kluskafi, which is our, the, the, the father of us, who created us. But there was also other spirits, like Adzi Ojo. Adzi Ojo, and also uh, people, uh, we call him Big Hairy Man, but you guys might call him Bigfoot, or Yeti. Uh, he's a spirit. 
same thing with spirit of the drum and all the other spirits. No different than Christianity, who has, uh, you know, they have uh, angels, archangels, uh, saints, and all kinds of other spirits themselves. We have our spirits as well, which are, they kind of, you know, we have our spirits, they all mesh together, they're all up there, right? So, Ozzy Ozo, when the magical dust from the Creator was falling to earth, Blue Scopy was formed and fell down onto the ground onto his feet. He got most of the dirt. So when, when Ozzy Ozo had formed, his back was stuck. He was stuck on the earth. He was going, help, help me. Anybody there? Kind of stuck. Well, Guscapi and the creator heard him calling. And they were like, you hear something? So they started to investigate. And they came over and they see this, this form of this, this spirit, this person that's, uh, that's stuck to the ground. So they said, well, we can't leave him like that. So they chiseled around him. The creator got on one side and uh, Guscapi got on the other. And they pulled and pulled until they ripped him up out of the ground. But of course, he didn't have any legs. He only had a torso, you know, from here up. So he was kind of looked at Guscapi, who had his legs, and looked at the creator, and he got pretty mad. He was like, I've been cheated. He's got legs. How come I don't have legs? You know, you he got formed out of the same stuff I do. How come I got cheated? So Azzioso was pretty pretty upset, pretty mad. So he decided to, like any uh, anybody who gets mad, sometimes my wife, when she gets mad, she stomps up Mount Philo, you know? So Ozzy Elzo was like, he couldn't stomp away because all he had was a torso up, so he had to drag himself, right? So he goes, he was mad, so he started like this, and he started pulling himself all over the place, which created the Champlain Valley and all the valleys. As he pulled himself, he drug these valleys, which created all of the valleys that you see around the Champlain Valleys, all this, all the other valleys in Vermont. And uh, so, Guscapi felt sorry for Azzioso. But in our culture, in order to get something, you have to give something in return, right? It's cyclical. You can't just take. Just like you can't just take all the natural resources and think they're going to last. If you take something, you've got to replace it with something, right? You've got to give something back. So, there's only one exception to that rule. Is if we know somebody needs something and they can't afford to give us something back, we can lay something down. Like when we have our Christmas, when we lay something on a blanket, we know what people need, so we put those things on a blanket and we walk away. And then if you need it, you pick it off the blanket, but you're not obligated to pay anybody else. Everybody picks from the blanket. But you've given something, but you're not obligated to that person, right? So anyway, so as Ozzy Ozo left, Guscapi says, okay, I want to help him out. So he took some dirt. And just like when you're on the beach and you make, you make little legs, he made legs and he left them. Because he knew Ozzy Ozo would come back to where he started after he cooled down, right? Just like your wife who might stomp off, she's going to come home, right? Now, she still may not be happy, but she's going to come home, right? So he made it He made it right there, right where uh, Ozzy Ozo is, right where he was laying. And then he, he left. So, I don't know if it sounded like that, but it was. he, he kind of left. And then uh, <coughs> Ozzy Ozo eventually... Ozzy Ozo eventually came back. And he was looking and he said, oh my God. He saw legs where they weren't there before. And he was kind of surprised. He's looking. He's like, wow, there's some legs there. Wonder where they came from. They weren't there before. So he started getting closer. Well, does anybody know what happens when two magnets come together? They can either propel or start attracting, right? So as he started getting closer, he started feeling this pull. And he's like, oh my God. Oh my God, all of a sudden, wham, his torso sucked right into these legs. And they go, oh man, I'm stuck again. But his hands were free. So what did he do? He took his hand like this. And anybody know what mountains are older here? Green mountains. Green mountains are older than the Adirondacks. Anyway, so he's stuck. 
he took his hand like this and he starts chiseling around his butt and around his legs and he goes Ugh. he's trying to pull up so he puts his hand on the ground and he pushes real hard and he gave, made himself free that created the green mountains so when he pushed up he pushed up the green mountains so then he started chiseling around on the other side and he started pulling and he pulled out and he goes Ugh. and that formed the Adirondacks so now you have both mountains well he had to get up now he wanted to see things from a new light. So he grabbed those mountains and he raked down the sides as he pulled himself up, which created the rivers and the streams. And he pulled himself up. Well, now he could see everything. Anybody looked at a map, topographical map of Lake Champlain, you'll see the torso and two legs going in, in Grand Isle, kind of splitting right in the middle. You'll see the torso, like I said, and the legs of where Ozzy Ozo came out of the ground. So he walked around, and as he was walking around saying, oh, this is awesome, I get to see everything from a new height. He goes, well, I got these legs. Gluscopy must have gave them to me. So I wanna, I wanna repay that. So how would you repay that? Gluscopy is the creator, our father, who created us. He goes, I know, I'll protect his people. against their enemies. So when he decided to do that, he said, I will transform onto our shores, the Abenaki shores, to protect the Abenaki people against their enemies. But before I do that, this is such a beautiful spot, I need to take care of the waterways. Right? Everybody cares about the cleanup of Lake Champlain. Everybody cares about the waterway, right? We do. It's our life. It carries our memories. So he needed something to go patrol those things. Hence, he created what you call Champ, who we call Gitagog. So how did he do that? Well, he reached down in the water and he said, whatever this has to be, it has to be a fighting thing. It has to have real strong whiskers to feel things and horn. Anybody grab a bow pout and get picked by it? Have, anybody's ever had a catfish or something? They got horns on their fins. So he took a bow pout and he said, okay, I'm going to take that as a face. And he said, okay, but it needs some armor. So I'm going to take this cart and he smooshes it right into the bow pout. So now he's got this weird looking bow pout face with armor, like with a cart. And he said, well, it needs to be able to swim. Someone grabbed an eel and he shoved it right up his butt, or attached it to his butt. So now he's got a long tail. But he may have to go to other waterways. So we have to have legs. So he grabbed a salamander, shoved it right up under his belly. So now he's got a long neck, bow pout face, like a horn pout. Got whiskers, long neck, salamander body, but it had armor on it. So that's how Champ was formed, to navigate the waterways and to report back to him if there was any problems. When that happened, Adziozo said this was good, and he transformed himself into Rock Thunder so he could always be there to protect us. But Champ, just like Bigfoot or Yeti and Big Hairy Man, they're spirits who can manifest themselves so you can see them, but you can't capture them, right? So that's no different than uh, the Christ people who believe in God and then uh, the burning bush and Jesus appearing to you. Are you going to catch God in a trap? I probably don't think so, right? I mean, you can't catch champ and you can't catch uh, Bigfoot or, or Yeti because they are spirits who transform themselves. So anyway, that's the story of how the lake was created and how champ was created to protect the waterway. I think I've used up all my time, but if anybody ever wants to know anything about us, they can go to AbenakiTribe.com. Uh, I'm always out there. Like I said, Chief Don Stevens, uh, people know how to get a hold of me or, or search for us. Uh, and I want to turn this over to Mary so they can get along with their programs. But uh, I want to thank you. Olawani means thank you.
uh, or Olu, Oli Bumpkini, thank you very much for coming, and uh, and I uh, appreciate you listening to our our story and uh, the Abenaki people. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chief Stevens, and thank all of you for coming to this event. Um, my name is Kathy Shapiro. I'm with Vermonters for Justice in Palestine. You can find information about us on the wall there. Um, we work to um, protect the rights of the Palestinian people to land and to equal rights and um, the right of return for Palestinians to land that they were forced to leave in 1947. Um, and this is a combined event that Mary Tomasetti is going to tell you much, much more about. We have a website. It's vtjp.org with a lot of information. Um, please go to that for more information on the Palestinian and Bedouin part of this program, which is to happen. So thank you again for coming. Hi everybody. I'm Mary Tomasetti. I'm with Tree of Life Educational Fund. Uh, we do have a microphone. We're working out the glitches, but hopefully you can hear me okay for now. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, good. Excellent. I can. All right. Good news. <laughs> so, um, so thank you, Kathy and Anita uh, and Ginny, our hosts here. Uh, really, really grateful to bring this program to you. Uh, just very quickly about Tree of Life Educational Fund. We started out of a church, the first congregational church in Old Lyme, Connecticut. We're now a 501c3. And since 2004, we have been bringing Israeli and Palestinian voices of conscience to speak out about the occupation and share the stories that are of a reality that we don't hear from our news media. Uh, in addition to bringing Voices of Conscience here to speak to American audiences, we also take annual witness journeys to Israel and Palestine so that people can see for themselves and experience for themselves what it means for, the, for folks to be under occupation in this area. Our next journey will start on August 31st. That's a trade union journey. So the PGFTU, the Palestinian trade unions, are calling for help just in the same way that the South African trade unions did. And the trade union involvement in the United States really helped to push apartheid to its end. We hope that the same thing will happen with the occupation so that the Palestinian people can live freely. Traditionally, our programs have been in churches and college universities, uh, colleges and universities, indoor speaker programs. And they've been very effective, but one of the things we noticed was our audience became people that we knew, people that we knew already knew what was going on, and we weren't reaching new audiences. So we decided that being outside and in the streets and on the road would help to raise awareness with the American population, and we think that's really critical to ending the occupation. So that's part of half of the idea behind Native Voices, a traveling encampment. The other piece is that the people that we want to serve, our Palestinian friends, have said to us, thank you for sharing our struggles, but we also want people to know that we are resilient, that we are strong, and like our Native American family, we will stand strong, and there is hope. And then we have culture that we want to share with your American audiences. So in response to that request from our Palestinian friends, we are trying to bring more programs such as this, including music, including poetry, including all of the beautiful culture and arts that these people can share with us. So thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, next up in our program is going to be my Lakota Ho-Chunk brother, Travis Harden. Travis will share with you some stories of his Native American culture, as well as his experiences in Palestine. Travis has traveled twice to Palestine, sure, once on with me. Um, and it was an amazing experience. Um, after Travis, we're going to hear from our Bedouin friend, Khalil Alamor. Khalil comes from the south of Israel, the Nakab or Negev desert, and he is Bedouin. So you'll learn a little bit about his culture, his history, and a little bit of the current struggle. Uh, after Khalil, we're going to hear some amazing music from Albert Basile. Albert is our brother from Bethlehem, Palestine. 
currently studying at Berkeley School of Music. And Saber Shreem, our dear friend and actor, where are you? I can't see you, Saber. I think he's back in the corner. Saber will join us for just a very small piece of a performance that he does. It's not conducive to outside, but we're going to show you just a little clip of it. And then Saber will share his experiences living in Janine. So thank you very much, and please help me to welcome Travis Harden. Oh, nice, thanks. <laughs> My name is Travis Harden. My Indian name is Ite Shakia. It means paint his face red. It was my great, great, great grandfather's name that they gave me. But I just want to sing a fast song kind of to open um, what I'm doing. This is one of our powwow songs. With, there's not really any words in it. It's just a style of changing notes. I mean, I, have, I know many songs, but I, this is ones that are, are kind of my favorites. And anyway, anyway, um, I've been teaching children how to sing for like 40 years now, and I took nursery songs and made them into in half nursery and half Indian. And I'll just kind of share a couple of those real fast. You might recognize them. <laughs> this little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home. Way out here. This little piggy had better wind blast. This little piggy had a way out here. This little piggy went hee 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 ho, all the way home, way out here. This little piggy went to Walmart. This little piggy went to the mall, way out here. This little piggy went to Taco Bell. This little piggy had none, way out here. This little piggy went hee 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 ho, all the way to Mexico, way out here, yo. songs have like two parts. In the second part, you hear the honor beats like that. And what those mean is we're showing respect, we're thanking, and we're honoring all our elders for everything that they teach us. But not only that, we're honoring our, maybe our ancestors that may, may be here with us now. And when I sing, like especially around here in Connecticut, I come out here and I see these big giant trees, you know, these huge ones, probably even this one, you know, and I like to sing to them because they don't, I tell children, I, 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 you know, they don't have eyes and ears, but they can hear us and they can probably see us. And, and they, these big ones have probably see, heard the, the, the Pequots or, you know, the uh, Bohegans or the, the, the Mohawks or the Oneidas, whoever was here singing a long time ago. Oh, the Abenak, yeah, yeah. Mohawks Sorry, my bad. Side. But anybody, you know, they probably heard them singing, you know, and so I always think maybe they didn't get to hear singing and so, I like to sing to them and you sing loud and you know let them let them let them know that I'm here to sing for them and as they wave at me see they're all waving at me now and same with the water and the grass and the, if you look at the little rocks the uh, you can almost imagine little faces you know mother earth is alive and I'm a water protector I was at the at the standing rock 
um, protest camp for like five months. <laughs> Mini Wee Tony, water is life. And I've, like, I've, like Mary said, I've been to Palestine twice. And while I've, all my life, I've grew up hearing what I've heard on the media. And the, all they've ever wanted, seemed like the, all they've ever wanted me to think was that all Palestinians are terrorists and all they want to do is kill us. So I went over there and I didn't know anything about it. And I learned so much and it changed my life. And, and when I saw the Palestinian people, I, I saw us, you know, the same thing happening. And, you know, like they used the buffalo on us. I've seen a picture where there's like piles, big as that four story building, you know, almost a, a buffalo skulls, you know, maybe it was only three stories, but it was big. And, you know, they, they tried to use it as a genocidal move to, to, so we wouldn't have a, our food source, you know. And so they're doing the same thing now with water with our, with, and in Palestine. I've seen pictures of places where children swam and, and they, you know, they got to have water. And now I, and when I went to Palestine, I went there and it's all dried up. They're damming up all the waters and, and they're, they're big, using it for their settlements where they just build and they just bulldoze whatever's in their way. And they send their sewage down to where the Palestinian farmers are trying to farm. And, you know, they're good. You probably heard about a lot of other things that they do, but I'm not going to spend too much time about that. But the same, I went to the Bedouin camp, Bedouin, uh, you know, and they're bigger than this, but I was inside and I was singing to the children and they were smiling and laughing and, you know, they were just happy. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, not, how can they be do, like so still happy living in, you know, a world like this, but that's their lifestyle. And, you know, they're like they took, like they took our land and made it smaller smaller and smaller as and as, as he'll as my friend Cleo will tell you about you know just the same things that happened to us a century ago is happening in in, um, in, in uh, Palestine so um, you know I, I really feel that you know we share something we're in, our, we're, our people are in solidarity but we don't know that much about it because they're on the other side of the world and we got our own problems to worry about so we don't we don't really, so I, I kind of made a commitment to my to my people to try to teach them and educate them, get, educate them about what's really going on with the Palestine and Bedouin people, you know, and, you know, they're, they're just kind of like us, you know. I've seen their children, they look just like our children, you know, and they're all waving and happy, you know, and like we get tourist buses at, on a reservation and we're not waving and we're not smiling at them, you know, I don't, it's a different kind of thing, but I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to share a little bit about my Palestine life, but I just want to sing uh, maybe another song or two. Um, I probably don't got much time left, but uh, <coughs> this is a, um, <coughs> a water protector song, you know. you know, it, They may contaminate all our water someday, you know. Maybe it won't happen in my life, but, you know, we when we had our camp, there was thousands of us, and we were all this, there was no racism, there was... It was beautiful because everybody was for the same thing, for the water. You know, we, we didn't see each other as different colored people. We just, everybody, you know, we just, every, everybody you saw, you shook their hand and hugged them, you know, and it was, it was such a beautiful time and place. And then they, you know, they were shooting. I was singing up at the front lines one time and I was going to sing that song I was singing for you, for singing and I thought, okay, I could, all my friends and cousins were getting shot by the police. And I, I was going up. Speaking of police, uh, anyway, I was walking up and I was thinking, I can take a hit, you know, and, and a bullet went right past my head, you know, like this far away, and I, I think they were trying to shut me up. So then I, you know, started getting down like this, you know. But uh, anyway, you know, that that's what, that's some of the things that happened to us, and, it, you know, we still, all we're trying to do is pray for the water and, and uh, save the water, and they just went and put that pipeline under our Missouri River anyway. Once, once uh, you know Trump got in, he was behind the whole thing. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I hope. It does, I hope I'm just praying for my grandchildren. I have 15 grandchildren. That's why I was there fighting for the water. But anyway, I'm going to sing a couple, a uh, melody of, uh, of kind of a few songs because I don't have much time left. <coughs> Two. 
that one. Praying for our children. Mini we Tony water is life. Way a ha, way a ha, yo. We are a Chetty Shako. Our ancestors stand with us. the word of what's really going on in the outside the world and uh, so Clea I would like to come up and you know we, we share the same kind of uh, solidarity and he'll tell you more about it all right thank you everybody for coming thank you very much my friend Travis I am really happy to share with you my experience of uh, some of the past of my community the Bedouin community and some of the maybe the challenges that we are facing in our daily life today. So this is the Bedouin tent, as you can see. But I am coming to you from this side as a guest now. This is your tent. And guests always have to come from the back, never from the front, you know. And this, in your right side now, is the guest 
a house is the, is the guest part. The tent is always separated to two parts, at least, sometimes three, but uh, two parts. This one is for the guest, as you see, you, uh, we have two rugs here, one for the host and one for the guests. We will see soon where every side can sit. And this is uh, like a separation wall. <laughs> it's something that separates the room that they can cannot see the family. Kids are not allowed to see the family. That's why they come from the back. And the host is standing here normally. And when he hears the voice of the animal or the, the, the dogs that normally outside, keeping the, the folks, you know, the sheep and the goats and the camels, and they're sparking. And uh, the host go outside and welcome his guests, say, Ahlan wa sahlan. Ahlan wa sahlan in Arabic is more even than welcome. You are very welcome here. And he ties his uh, horse or his camel for the, the host and welcome him to come inside. And he sits in this side. The guest sit in his side, this side, with the face to the host, uh, sit in the opposite side. So his back is always to the, to, the, to the family. He cannot see the family. Even if they run and he holds here inside, he cannot see inside. So uh, always he offered them coffee. Coffee. They don't even offer. They just uh, bring the coffee and serve it. <laughs> the same with the food. Uh, plenty of food. Even they are very poor and very humble life. But they always serve and give all they, uh, all they have. They don't have anything in the fridge. They prepare everything. <laughs> they don't have fridge even. So they serve the food, they give the coffee, and it is amazing. The coffee have to be fresh. They prepare it instantly for you. So I remember my father was making the fire, lighting the fire, roasting the beans, green beans, and crush them in the crater. I don't know if it is this, the, the, the right name. It's a piece of wood that have a hole inside it, and, and they do this. Uh, to maybe illustrate that, I, I, uh, I brought the, the voice for you, so I can, I can uh, let you hear that. Maybe you will recognize it. It's very beautiful music that he was doing with this. This is the music. that you are doing with this uh, instrument, yes. Yeah. It is 45 seconds. <laughs> From the YouTube. It's not my father's, unfortunately. But it is very, very similar. So he ground them in this way and served the coffee. And one day I really wanted to, to help my father. He, I noticed that he worked very hard. So I went to one of the electric shops and, and bought the grounding machine, you know, this one that you put a lot of coffee, you press the bottom, and it makes the coffee grounded. And handed it to my father. I was proud that I did something good. And he looked at my face like this and said, what is this good for? I said, this is for you. You can ground coffee very quickly. He said, OK, you can keep it for you. <laughs> he didn't like it. He said, you studied in the university, but you don't understand anything in hospitality. <laughs> this is the inviter. He said, this is the inviter. When he ground the coffee, all his neighbors and his friends hear the music, and they come to have the coffee with them. And this is his pleasure, to have the, the guests and the friends. And uh, when they pour the coffee for you, they always offer you one third. They are small cups. And even that they are small, they put one third. And they talk a bit, and a few minutes, they will offer you another third. And another third. 
So by the end of the day, you have your whole cup. But it's in, in installments, yeah. you know. If, if they offer you one full cup, it means one thing in the Bedouin hospitality. Take it and go. <laughs> you are not coming. <laughs> so it's crazy. Don't feel insulted if they offer you a small cup, you know. When I was roaming with Josh and, uh, and Mary, I, uh, I noticed a sign in one of the, uh, like a sighting in one of the, of the restaurants in our breakfast. It says, of course size matters. Nobody wants a small cup of coffee. I said, this is not right. I want a small cup of coffee. <laughs> so I always tell Mary, if my father see me drinking uh, a coffee in big cups like Coca-Cola, you may not win. <laughs> will laugh at me all the time. <laughs> so it's like showing disrespect for the coffee. <laughs> but um, this is another uh, culture. I understand that it's OK. Uh, one maybe uh, sentence or two about the, uh, the, the, the things they usually made of hair goat, of hair of goat, uh, and the black. And I normally say, what is that black? It's ugly, it's not beautiful. But I realized when I grew up that the, 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 the hair of the goats have a, an oil leather on it. And when it's, it's wet, it's like a waterproof. The water just was, you know, splatting like this on the, on the, on the tent and, and doesn't come inside. I, I don't remember that the, 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 the the water coming is always dry. Uh, and, uh, and behind the tent, they have like a small canal, like a small place that the water can run inside. They dig it with them, with many tools. And always protected and happy. I grew in a tent, finished my high school in a tent, and, my, and I remember my first or second year in the college, it was in a tent. So this is uh, our uh, past, and uh, I am so happy uh, to share that with you. But uh, unfortunately, this life has changed in the last few years. And uh, we have been facing a lot of challenges um, after the establishment of uh, the State of Israel, especially, and the land they grabbing everywhere and taking and confiscating and all these. So the, the land minimized and the strength that we have. And many people gave up their, their original and ancestral life and cultural life. And these changes that I'm going to, uh, with the, uh, your help, Mary, I, I wanted to show you the, the pictures maybe we will uh, talk about. So this is my village. If you look at the village, you don't see tents. There is no more tents. So the life changed, really. You see some houses with, the, with tin roofs on them. So the, uh, the people build them very quickly. So they don't want to get, you know, caught. And uh, the, the, uh, the, the houses can be demolished. We have a lot of demolitions. We will talk about demolitions soon. So we didn't uh, uh, bring the, the, the map of the, the world to show you where is Israel, because you already know. <laughs> but for children, I would do that maybe. Um, this Israel, you see, you see all the Israel. In this side we have Jordan, and this side we have uh, Egypt and Sinai. But we are mainly talking about this part of Israel, which is where the Negev, the Nakab in Arabic we saw it, Nakab, Negev, where where I live. This is where my community live in the circled area. You can see. I hope you can see in the back. It's a Normally, we, uh, we beam them on the screen, but here uh, we have beamed them on the trees, and the uh, tree doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we will focus on the Negev, and you see, we will zoom in on the Negev and show you the picture on the maps soon. Here you see we have the Negev. I'm sorry, Mary. <laughs> yes, this is the Negev. The southern part, it's a huge area. It's about two thirds of the state land. It's about three million acres. And only 10% of the population live there, Jews and Bedouins and everybody. 
only 10% of the name. So it's empty area. Anyway, they confiscated most of the land. They expelled our population. About 90,000 people we, uh, were in 1940. About, uh, only 11,000 of those 90,000, only 11,000 survived the Nakba. The Nakba is the name of the disaster. We call it a Nakba in Arabic. It's a disaster. Uh, in all Palestine, you know, many Palestinians were built. 500 villages were destroyed. You know the story. But I am now concentrating in the Negev and the, and the Bedouin community in the south. I'm not talking about all the Palestinian story, which is very important and, and well known. So the people who remained, the 11,000 who remained, who survived the, the Nakba, they just relocated them and concentrated them into this highlighted area. You can see the Arabs around. It is called the Siyaj area. Siyaj in Arabic is a fence, the fence area. You can say reservation area, the same. So you look now how, how similar the stories of the American, Native Americans and the, and the Native Bedouins are, the indigenous Bedouins are. Uh, this reservation area is only 10% of the Negev lands, 10%. But as I always say in my mathematic way, think about that, I say 10% of our population survived, remain with 10% of the land, the same. Okay, let's take it. But you know, <laughs> Israel is Israel. And uh, the situation you will see will get created. So we'll take the Siyaj area, the reservation area, and zoom in again and see. Here is the reservation area where we all live. You can see. This 10% shrink. And today we are talking about less than 5%. Uh, you can see many things in this map now. You can see green spots in it. Those green spots are the seven towns that the government built for the Bedouin community. They want to take the Bedouin from their lands and put them into these towns. But as I always say, these towns are not the paradise that they're promising. It is the hill. People are suffering there. They don't find work. They don't find places to stay. They, do, they can build their houses. It's very expensive to live in the city. or the, And they are not trained to live in this. They are nomadic people and uh, herders and uh, desert agriculture to live in the city, it's not easy. And uh, doesn't provide the, the solutions really that the people want. So uh, one, one small point, one, one is that the, those small dots, the small point that you can see around in purple car, it is 35 unrecognized villages that the government don't recognize, don't support, don't give them electricity, no water, no clinics, no kindergartens. And those small dots, you may be, maybe see them later if you want in the map. And they pressure them to move to the cities and the towns. And they still refuse. I am one of them. So our little dot is here, nearby the airport. They build the airport here. And this is our dot. And I'm going to talk about one of them, my village. Before that, we show the way that the government pressured the community. This is the big instrument that the president always in the villages, bulldozer. We have like five to eight hundred demolitions a year. You can I ask my friends in, uh, in the coexistent forum, in the negative coexistent forum, Haya Noah and others, that reporting these numbers every year. The other one is for one family that I just remember and know them. You see, uh, this is a child that just came back from school and found his, his house turned down. So we have 800 demolitions a year. 
All this doesn't convince the Bedouin, and it doesn't convince me at least. We have another tools. You can see them blue. Another bulldozer that blow the fields that can destroy the fields if they cultivated some wheat or barley. This is what we can do in the prison. And it is also blowed, as you can see, or destroyed. After it, it, it has already grown. So the green becomes red. Yes. If this is, doesn't help, there is another tool, which is the water system. You can see it is a very powerful tool that they try to pressure the people through. Every family, this is not a, a, the connection for every family. The, each connection is for a village, for a, hundreds and tens of families share the same connection. And if you are lucky, like my family and my village, you have one inch for the village. We have one inch, this one, in your right side. The others have half an inch, and some have three quarters. But we are the luckiest. We have one inch for the village. It's, uh, we, get, we, we received that, we got that after 50 years of the establishment of the state. We got that in 1998. From 1948 till 1998. It is a problem of the water supply no running water in many villages. And they carry the water in tankers. Um, it's very, very dangerous waters. This is one of the villages. It's called Atir. Atir is one of the villages to be uprooted. And they want to uproot it. This time is another excuse, another reason. We They are going to expand the forest. We have Yar Yatir, the forest of Yatir. We have about 28 million trees. We will have now 29 million trees. And that's why they going to uh, uh, uproot Atir. By the way, Atir was uprooted in 1956 by the Israeli government. And they were put in, uh, in this area, moved to this area. Their lands were given to the kibbutz. The kibbutz name is Shuval. And they are cultivating their lands up to date. Now they say, you are trespassers and invaders. You can move to one of the seven towns. The nearest one is Hora. It's one of the seven, if you remember, the seven spots. Oh, that's good. I am going to show with my village. <laughs> this is my village. And this picture is very important for me to, to show you. You know, we are invisible. The Israeli planners, when they sit in the air-conditioned room, they don't see us. We don't appear in any official map. And we don't have signs that show the location of the villages. If you drive in the desert, you wouldn't see a sign that says, this is Asera, this is uh, Hura. No, Hura is one of the recognized, but uh, Atir or uh, any other village. You cannot see the names. But we change this. We had our map that we created, it's locally, known only among the community. And we put sign, this sign we mounted by ourselves. We brought the sign and ordered that in the uh, <laughs> place. And put the same name you can see, Arabic, Hebrew, English, the same colors, green and white. And we added the line here in the bottom, who can read Hebrew, can say that, can see that it is it says established in the Ottoman period <laughs> yes it is and <laughs> the more the more funny thing I think is this sign that you can never meet in the roads it's uh, it's hard to see from there but you can see it's a bulldozer demolishing houses ahead yes um, another friend of mine says that you should you should uh, change it to um, a red circle that says no demolitions here, <laughs> but we didn't really. So you can see it again. Uh, this is our sign we put by ourselves, and I love it very much. Uh, my guests always take picture of this sign. It is in the entrance of the village. So. 
So we try to, to, to change this situation by all means. This is my house. You can see the house, the porch outside the car, and this is me here on the stairs. And I love this place, but I don't feel confident really. I don't feel happy sometimes because of the threats of being displaced all the time. Those guys posting the demolition orders in my house in 2006, it started, it's an old picture, and the police there are protecting them. It's one of about 20 that were uh, down the stairs that protecting this one from me, I'm dangerous. And uh, they posted those demolition orders in, in all the houses of the village. But I am happy to tell you that all those demolition orders were revoked. We went to the court and continued fighting for eight years. In 2014, the judge, Tali Khaimovich, says that these demolition orders are illegal and I am canceling them. They claimed for public need and she said, public need have to be strong and be clear. It is not, so I cannot leave those n people that predate the state with no rules. And she canceled them finally. Uh, so we are protesting, you see. We are protesting everywhere in uh, Beersheba, the, the, the district city there, in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, everywhere. We try to change this situation. We are not really uh, playing the role of the victims and only crying. We're trying to do something by ourselves sometimes. And this is one of the ways, it's not the only one. We don't have electricity, remember, but I have solar panels, you see. This is my roof and uh, these are the solar panels. And I convinced all the families in my village to leave the generators and move to the solar panels. And today, we have 70 families, 500 people, all powered with solar panels. So we are a green village. We are a green village. And I love that, really. Uh, last, uh, two weeks ago when I came, I just um, participated in a conference in, uh, in Geneva. And there I visited the company that produced the inverters that I am using, a studer. It's a, a Swiss company, and they were very, very happy to have me there and also me. It's exciting. So this is the solar panels, alternative power. So if we want to really conclude all this thing, we see, we see the similarity between our case and our bro uh, native brothers here. Uh, the Indian uh, Native Americans, whatever you call them. And uh, you see, here is the green color, the Palestinian lands everywhere. You see them shrinking, shrinking, and shrinking. And finally, we see small pieces of reservations and, and dots everywhere. The same with the Americans here, if you look, look at, the, at the red color here, shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Today, we, you have only the reservations. Uh, so it's really uh, unbelievable situation that uh, the people in the modern societies and democratic societies like United States today and Europe and everywhere I speak, I think they need to stand for those people and to train and, and to change the situation just to to have more justice. This is not a just situation. And I think native people and everywhere have to be respected, their rights have to be respected. They did that in Australia, even that they have many mistakes there, but they changed. In, in New Zealand, they changed, they did very good. And even in, in, in United States, I think the situation is better than in the beginning, of course. They are not killing more Indian people here, but <laughs> This is not good. And in Israel, we are not expelling, they are not expelling people to Jordan and Egypt. We have more than half a million Bedouins in, 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 in Jordan today. Besides the other uh, Bedouins there, 
I'm talking about the Bedouins that came from Bir al Saba, where I live, from the Sheva area. And we know them and they know us. So uh, we leave the questions maybe to, uh, to the end, but I want to thank you very much for having us here and uh, for your attention. Thank you.
Thank you. My name is Albert Basile. I'm from Bethlehem, Palestine. And as Mary said, I now study at Berkeley College of Music. So I live in Boston. And uh, I just started in January. So the spring was my first semester. And in the fall, I'm going to do my second. So I want to tell you a little bit about my work in Palestine, what I used to do before coming here. I used to work with uh, two organizations. One is Musicians Without Borders, and the other one called Towns of Palestine. And so with Sounds of Palestine, we were um, targeting children from the refugee camps, especially Aida refugee camp. And if you know, like a refugee camp is the place where now Palestinians live who were kicked out from their homes and lands in 1948. And it's like the place just next to the wall and the door, like where the Israeli military saw like lots of guns, clashes, tear gas. And so like the kids' social, children's social life there and what they see is really terrible. So we see like this program, just we want to take those people from this place and like make them have good, happy life with the music and trying to t solve like using music, trying to help them with their social problems and also like as a way of resistance and also as music, like because like they don't have this like access to music as other people and other children because they have their own problems to deal with. So like for me as my experience music has changed my life and like I choose that the music that's the thing that I want to do. And so I believe also in those kids there are some of them who want to do music in their life and like they want to become musicians. So I feel that's really important for them. And the other, the other program was called uh, Musical Playground. It was with Musicians Without Borders. Maybe you heard of those guys. And so we used to go to schools in Palestine in like isolated areas where like they're really poor schools. They have um, not great education. They don't have also music. So we give them like music workshops for three days, like give them very basic things, music, which they don't know. And also like it's kind of just to show them different happy music life. And um, all the time when we go to schools, we could feel like how this is really important for the kids because we could feel like how happy they are when they, they are doing music with us. So that's about my work. I want to tell you about my instruments that I play. Uh, so this is this instrument called Drek. It's not a tambourine. Uh, it looks like tambourine, but if you so, we play it in very different way. I'll show you. So we use this technique uh, with fingers. We depend a lot on fingers, like... And we have also this technique where we use the jingle. doesn't sound good this instrument is broken it has some problem I have to fix so it should sound much better and uh, this is the frame drum uh, we call it mazhar or deaf uh, or I can tell you about this instrument that also we use our technique which is depend which depends a lot on fingers to play it like also Native Americans, they have this drum and other cultures also they have to, this drum, they play a different way. But I'm gonna show you like the basic hits, how we do that on this drum. So we 
we have the low sound, which is the dome, we play it with our thumb. And we have the tuck, uh, the high sound on the edge with our finger. And also like we use accents by using like this technique. And the last instrument, this called darbuka or dumbek. In Palestine, we call it tabla. And it's too, it's made by like from metal, it has plastic skin, and uh, the two basic sounds from this instrument they are the dom, the deep sound, and the tag. And yeah, these are the basic sounds. We have this lab too. So you can start from here if you want to play this instrument. And I would like to teach you like two Arabic rhythms before, before I'm done. Uh, the first one called Baladi. It's very famous in Arabic music. So we're going to use this basic sounds. I want you to do the dome on our like, leg. So that's the dome with two hands. That's cool. And so the tuck is clapping, the blue tuck is clapping. So I'm gonna show you the rhythm first. It's like that. Boom, 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 keep going. Chef Tatelli, and it's like that. Wow, that's good job. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Hi, this is, uh, yeah, come. So the only reason I'm up here, my name's Josh Perlstein, and I work with uh, Mary and Tree of Life. But before that, I was very privileged and have been very privileged to work for the last 10, not with microphones. Um, for the last 10 years with the Freedom Theater, which is a theater in the Janine refugee camp in the, in the West Bank. Uh, I first started going there in 2008, and in 2013, I met, I met this guy and taught him for a month. And the reason I'm talking now is because in the time since then, since his training at the Freedom Theater, he has gone on to study um, Mime and Commedia dell'arte at Paris with um, in the Lecoq School. He's performed and traveled all over Europe, including Amsterdam. And right after he finishes here, he's going to be heading to Amsterdam for his uh, really his first professional, real professional acting job uh, in Amsterdam. His name is Saber Shrem. And the reason I'm telling you this, and he's not telling you this, is because the work that he performs is comes from a tradition of theater which is considered to be Sacred. sacred. So the mask that he wears is, is sacred. And the style of movement is considered to be sacred. So this is really his, his shrine, his temple. And he really would prefer to be inside, but he is, I, I made him perform for you today. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story. Yes? <clears throat> So Saber and um, some other actors in Janine created this piece 
uh, based on the story of uh, Saber's family, who moved from Haifa, which was in, in, is in what is now Israel, and they moved, were forced to move from there to Jenin and live in Jenin away from their homes. They still have, as many Palestinians do, as many of you know, they still hold the key to their original houses, that they've kept the keys in the idea that someday they will go back and they will get their, get their houses back. Um, so he created this story. I, I imagine that it's partially true and partially from his imagination, but it's a story of a man who was forced to come from Haifa and live in Janine, and he had to work in a restaurant. And not only did he have to work in this restaurant, but he had to live in the kitchen. And he was never allowed out of the kitchen. But at night, he would sneak out, and he would go to the graveyard where his best friend and his brother and his f old love and finally his mother were buried. And so the very short segment that you're going to see, just a brief taste of what, of what Saber's work is, is a taste of that visit to the graveyard. Um, and so that's all I have to tell you. Is that good? Yes. Did I do a good job? Okay. Thank you so much. Well, um, I just want to tell you about this mask. Uh, this mask, it comes from the tradition of Comida del Arte. Did you hear about the word Comida del Arte? Yeah, so it came from Italy, right? This mask, it came, uh, they made it from a leather, right? Which is like, they made it from the back of the cow. And it takes us like normally four or five years to practice, you know, to make a show for one hour, right? Normally we don't do it in the outside because, you know, it has to be in the, in the theater, right? And as you saw, there is no decor. We don't use decor at all. You know, we do everything by miming, right? And there is only the position, right? And the mask and the actor and the light. So I just want to, to share with you this little piece about this Rivaji. His name is Auda, right? Auda means the return. And um, yeah, so thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Lakota culture, we we adopt a lot. We have to, we did that a long time ago. And then Lakota means, you know, uh, you might have know, you might have learned in the history books we're called Sioux Indians. You know, I don't know. That's just a girl's name to me, but you know, it's it's a it's a French word or it's a Chippewa word. The French used to give us snake in the grass or cutthroat or I don't. Know, I've heard a couple things, but we're Lakota. And, and, our, and our, our church is the, the Black Hills of South Dakota. It's the trees, the rocks, the water, the dirt, the animals, the insects, you know, it's, it's uh, Mother Earth. And that's our church. And so we, the Black Hills of South Dakota, we call it our Holy Land. So when I went from the, from the one Holy Land to the other Holy Land, across the world, to Bethlehem, that's where he is from. So we are, we, are, we might be uh, like making history, you know, having two, two cultures from the, both sides of the world coming together. And when I, when I first came back the first time, Albert traveled back with, with another uh, gentleman that plays the oud, the oldest instrument in the world, and his beautiful wife, Nadine, they sing, she would sing with her beautiful voice. And we, we, we went around all over to the universities and Cape Cod, New York, you know, we went to uh, 10, like 10 different places. In all those places we performed, I learned the, the song of the, pa the Palestine National Anthem. And I, so I sing it in the Lakota way, like the way I sing. And he's gonna play the, the rhythm and we're gonna collaborate two cultures from both sides of the world together. So uh, we just wanna close with this closing song. And we'll, we'll sing four, four times. And so, so there's two cultures, you know, the Palestine culture, Arabic, and Lakota. So we'd like you guys to join with us with clapping hands. And uh, maybe, uh, you know, some, somebody could start, yeah, he could, you know. Yeah, so, so anyway, it's just gonna be like this.
Thank you, everybody. Mini Week Tony, water is life. Hey! Thank you, everybody, for taking time and listening to us, and I hope you learned a little something about our cultures. Thank you.